What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we wrap up our series on harmony, looking at unity and community in our church. People here and in other places too are wondering, how do we get back to that group we used to be? How can we work together to make good things happen again? And we spent a couple of weeks now looking at this. We started with prayer and asking the Holy Spirit to be at work among us. When God is at the center of what we are doing, we recognize that it's not our will we are working toward, but rather God's will. Leaning on the Holy Spirit is an important first step. Last week we talked about speaking the truth in love, which is a good reminder that loving people and wanting good things for others isn't really enough. We have to have healthy boundaries and love people in genuine ways. We can't get stuck on trying to make ourselves look good. Instead, we honor one another by recognizing the gifts in each other and committing them to doing God's will among us. Now we conclude with a return to the Gospel of Matthew with what is perhaps one of the most cryptic passages in the entire Bible. And uh, I forget who's going to read our scripture. Oh, okay. All right, come on up. Uh, um, Jesus gathers his 12 disciples together. He sends them throughout Israel to share the good news, but then he offers a warning. There are going to be times where you are persecuted. You will share with others about God, and people won't like it. They won't listen, and they'll kick you out of their house. He goes on, though, describing the beatings and sufferings they will endure. Then he says the following, taken from Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 39. I invite you to hear now the word of the Lord. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for one penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whomever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Thank you, Kelly. And from Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we listen for God to speak to us today. God, may we be an inclusive community, community passionately following Jesus Christ. Help us to better understand the things that cause disunity so that we can find harmony among us. So often we want to work together with others, but we just can't find a way. 
Make a way, Lord, that we can be more faithful disciples of you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Although there is real war happening out in the world, most of us uh, don't experience it in our everyday lives. Instead, war has been replaced with sports as we cheer for our favorite football team or baseball team. Uh, I was at the Wyckoff fireworks just last night and was chatting with a friend. We were talking about sports, and I told him about a bit of a secret. I'm a big Buffalo Bills fan, having grown up in that city, but sometimes I feel like I'm a bad father. My son has somehow inexplicably decided that he is a New England Patriots fan. He starts busting up laughing and turns to the guy on the other side of him, who I had only just met, and says, you don't know Josh, he grew up in Boston. Uh, Thankfully, we avoided any altercations right there, but we had a lot of fun talking about how awful different cities can be to visiting fans. Uh, Sports can unite people, but it can also really divide us, too. But, you know, there's another area of life that can cause even more conflict among people, and that's politics. Years ago, there was a congressman, Bob Inglis, who was a representative in what he called the reddest district in the reddest state in the country. He described himself as a purist, uh, a real conservative that always got it right on every issue. But one day, things began to change. Bob Bob had five beautiful children, and his oldest, his son, had just turned 18 years old. He told his father, hey, I'm going to vote for you in the next election, but you really need to clean up your act on the environment. All Bob knew about the environment was that Al Gore was for it, so he was dead set against it. Uh, But his son's words kept ringing in his ears, and he took them to heart. Eventually, he joined the Science Committee in Congress, and he had the chance to travel with them. They went to Antarctica and the Great Barrier Reef, where he saw for himself firsthand the research and data from scientists that revealed the impact people were having on the world. He met one scientist who he recognized was a man of deep Christian faith who wanted to honor God through scientific research. By working to maintain a healthy environment, he saw himself as doing what he could to love God and to love his neighbor, even future neighbors whom he would never meet. This would all have a huge impact on Bob, and he proposed laws in Congress that would help move our country toward better stewardship of the environment. Initially, he felt good about this. He had listened to his son. He had learned and grown as a person. He was doing the right thing. But the voters back home had a different idea. They couldn't understand why he was doing this. And when it came time for the next election, Bob Inglis had a crushing defeat. He had represented his district for 12 years, but in the next primary, he had a stunning loss. He got only 29% of the vote, unheard of for someone who was the incumbent. And it hurt bad. I'm sure Bob wondered if he had done the right thing or if changing his mind was just a sign of his own weakness. It can be so hard to change our opinions and convictions. Now, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes frustratingly easy. Uh, When Emily, my wife, and I talk sometimes about what we want to do to the house or ways we want to organize things related to our children, usually we have a lot of common ground, but every once in a while we don't see eye to eye. Uh, Now that's normal. It's not a big deal, but the part that blows my mind is when one of Emily's friends tells her about a new way that they are doing things in their home, a great idea for the house or something for their children, And Emily tells me how excited she is for it. She wants to do the exact same thing. And I say, but that's what I told you six months ago. She wouldn't listen to me. Her mind was fixed. But as soon as one of her friends says it now, it's a great idea. Why does something like that happen? Why can we be so inflexible in one situation and totally compliant in another? Early on in life, we begin to develop something called mental rigidity. 
our thinking becomes rigid. It becomes defined. Now, often that's a good thing when you are, are little and you learn that mom and dad will hold you. They won't drop you. That's a good thing. When you take those first steps into the world and you find you can trust your own two legs, that too is good. Now compare that to my mom, who just spent a few days over at my brother's house. She said she used his Oculus set, which are these 3D goggles that you put over your head. When she put it on, she sees in this headset that she's high up in a building and she has to step forward onto a balance beam. Now, the whole thing is totally fake, right? All she has to do is take a step forward in the living room on hardwood floors. It's just a screen, but she can't do it. She can't take even one little step forward. A lifetime of mental rigidity tells her she can, but she won't do it. Why? Why can't she? And it's because she's learned another lesson along the way. She has a voice in the back of her head saying, Trust your eyes, trust your eyes, you can see that it's not safe. And that voice is so loud, she can't just trust and take that step forward. A lot of life is like this. We hear these different voices, different forces at work in our life, and it can be so hard to figure out which one is the right one to listen to. And Jesus, he wants us to break through the noise and do the right thing. He wants us to listen to him. That's what this passage in Matthew 10 is all about. For many of us, these are really tough words for us to hear. We have our baptism here today, and it is not lost on me how friends and family are gathered here to celebrate. You'd think if there is any one place where we are all going to be on the same team, always advocating for the family, wanting to nurture babies from birth, it's here, right? Yet Jesus says... I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Then he says, I've come to set a son against his father and a daughter against a mother. As if our most bitter enemies are supposed to be the people in our own homes. What? How does that make any sense? In Jesus' time, these words would have hit even harder than they do today. Then it was an absolute mandate to take care of a person's parents. I like to remind folks here of this every once in a while, that commandment to honor your mother and father, that wasn't written for little children to obey their parents. It was written to grown adults to take care of their aging parents on the edge of death. Honor them. Remember how much they gave to you. Don't turn your back on them now that they can't give to you the way that they once did. This was really important in Judaism. Family was everything. So to hear Jesus say he came to make family members enemies of each other is startling, to say the least. It sounds like Jesus is advocating for war, as if he wants us to take up weapons and defeat the enemies in our own households like it's the Civil War. Now, the good news is nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is reminding us of the real order of our priorities. As important as family may be, and it's really important, he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy. You cannot let anything be more important than God in your life. Jesus has to be the absolute top priority, and if he isn't, you're going to have some big problems. The division and war that Jesus brings only happens when people refuse to prioritize God in their lives, and Jesus wants you to prioritize him because the life that comes with living for God is vastly more satisfying. He says those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. That's the real goal here. In following God, we find real life. It's what Jesus calls in another place, life in its fullness. Connection with God leads to a kind of life that doesn't get mired in the short-term struggles. We see the long view and how there is an eternity in front of us that makes every moment right here and now beautiful. 
and special, even when it's difficult. It's like when you listen to an incredible song or watch a movie that transports you. It's not that all the problems in life disappear suddenly. No, but, but they are put into their proper perspective. Sure, things can be tough, but the world is good and beautiful. We are going to be okay. God's got us, and we can get through any division when we cast our cares on him. I know years ago, this church went through a particularly difficult season. There were several concerns, but much of it boiled over when the music director stopped working here. Many people left, and in some ways, the church has still not recovered from that injury. I'm so sad to know that music had such a large role in it. Music has such power. And I know God intends for us to unite together and to bring beautiful harmony among us. That didn't happen back then. But today we have an opportunity to choose life, to choose a path that unites us and blesses our community, that restores our witness to our neighbors as we say, sure, families can disagree, but our commitment, our priorities always with Jesus Christ first and forever. There's actually this delightful idea that comes from Adam Grant that reminds us how to work through such difficult agreements. He talks about the three Ps, preaching, prosecuting, and politics. In politics, we usually say whatever we need to say to appease others, We don't want to get voted out, so we do the expedient thing. In prosecuting, we are telling people what they've done wrong because it doesn't line up with our expectations. You are wrong, and I'm going to tell you about it. In preaching, you'd think this would be the good one, right? You'd expect me to want you to be preachers, but preaching too too often becomes simply defending a view you already hold. And I'll be honest, I don't think that helps people very much. In fact, my favorite part about preaching is that I get to study and learn so much every single week. I'm not doing this to defend myself or to defend God. God can do that all on his own just fine. I'm here because I want to learn more about God. I want to understand better the mysteries of this world and to bring people along with me. The three Ps, then, are not the right way not the right posture to bring about harmony. Instead, imagine a world where churches and communities don't argue with each other or fight one another, but instead stand together. Imagine what it would be like if we were always working to make this world a better place, period. The right posture for this is not preaching, prosecuting, or politics. It's to approach people and situations with curiosity. There's something called the 424 Project. It's this idea that spending four minutes every day with an intentionally curious attitude can change the world around us. It's listening without judgment, asking lots of good questions, being empathic. It's even being able to admit, I don't know, so you can keep working towards better answers. Albert Einstein once said, One cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries to comprehend only a little of this mystery every day. Four minutes a day of curiosity could change everything for you. Let's end with this. Uh, Diane was at a crossroads in her life. Her daughter had just left for college, and her husband had his own pursuits. Though she once enjoyed her work as a banker, lately she'd been wondering whether she should quit. What stopped her, though, was a nagging question. What would her boss and her co-workers think of her if she quit? As she mulled this over, she realized at 45 years old, something important. Lots of her decisions were based on what others thought of her. She had been her parents' golden child. She was a star student and had married a man that her parents heartily approved of. What if everything she chose was based on what others thought of her and never what God wanted for her? 
She was having a delayed identity crisis, so she got curious. She started journaling. She wrote a letter to her past self and her future self. She talked to her husband about her feelings, and they had bigger discussions uh, together about their dreams and how they would like to do more through their local church to help those in need. They started making changes, and Diane grew more confident in who she was and what she wanted in her life. One day, she even got into an argument with her father at the dinner table over politics, and instead of shooting her down, he respected her opinion. Diane was a changed person. A little bit of curiosity, asking good questions, didn't lead to the war she thought it would. It brought real life that gave her peace and harmony like nothing else could. That's what I want for our church. That's what I want for everyone. Harmony comes not by ignoring our differences, not by starting wars over politics or being rigid in our ideas. It comes with a curious spirit that stays engaged with others, even if they might disagree with us. As the psalmist says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one person sharpen another. Let our differences be a tapestry that evokes the beauty of the kingdom of God, remembering always and forever that God is our highest priority, and God will always draw us together as the community of the Lord when we take time to approach one another with a spirit of curiosity. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.